right, well, we are in November, and Thanksgiving is right around the corner, as we've talked about some today with Boxes of Hope. And uh, wow, what an amazing day so far. Isn't the Lord good? Just you see all of the, the things that God is doing and just worshiping Him and doing communion. Just such a, a rich experience today, and I'm thankful for that. And so Thanksgiving is right around the corner, and uh, this is the season where we really start to focus on and highlight the idea of having an attitude of gratitude and being thankful. And so in light of that, we're starting a, a new three-part message series today that's called The Comparison Trap. And a few years ago, Pastor Andy Stanley down at North Point Church in Atlanta, he introduced this idea in this way to his congregation. And he mentioned a problem that he had. And I, as I was listening to him, I realized that I've battled the same problem. And I think that you might have battled it as well. So I want to bring this series to our church so we can start dealing with some of this stuff too. So like Pastor Andy, I have noticed that instead of having an attitude of gratitude and an attitude of, of contentment, really, I have a tendency to compare myself to others. Like I'll sometimes base how I'm doing on how other people are doing. Anybody ever done that before? Where you, you look around and you compare yourself. And so I've tried to figure out why I do this. And so what I, what I did is I, I compared my tendency to compare myself with other people with other people's tendency to compare themselves. And then I realized that I'm just reinforcing the problem. So I'm not really getting anywhere there. It's an issue. And so for most of us, this problem probably most likely began in school. Because isn't it true that everything you do in school is compared to others? It's true on the playground. It's, it's true in the classroom, on tests. Uh, it's true in, in the gym, in the lunchroom. It's even true in the hallways. Everything you do is compared to others. And so you compare yourself to other students and other students compare themselves to you, and even teachers can sometimes fall into this trap of comparing students with other students or even themselves to other teachers. I remember when I was in fifth grade, we had to play the recorder. Anybody know what that is? You heard of a recorder before? It's like an intro to the flute or the clarinet, and it's this little musical instrument that the whole class gets one, and you all play together together. Um, I didn't say anything about it sounding good, right? Because I don't want to give any misconceptions here. Uh, but, but you all have to learn it. And so in our classroom, we had two chairs that were at the front, well, two desks, at the front of the class that we assigned to the two best people. We didn't, the students didn't assign them, the teacher did, the music teacher. And so we would play our songs, and there was a first chair and a second chair, and they were always the top in the class. And we all wanted to be that, but we knew that ultimately, you know, many of us never would, unfortunately. And so we, we all compared our ability with their ability, and we hoped that we would maybe eventually get in one of those chairs. And, and so we would love it when one of the people sitting in those chairs would mess up. You know what I mean? You hear him hit a wrong note, and you go, oh, yes, they're ta we're taking them down, right? We're gonna, they're going to be replaced, so that was a little bit of my fifth grade experience. And then later in ninth grade, I had played some basketball in middle school. And so I tried out for the high school team, the ninth grade team, and I didn't make it. I know, shocking. I didn't make it. I may be short, but I'm slow. Everyone except for me and this one other guy made the team. And so I just felt like a loser and I couldn't measure up. And, you know, the other guys on the team were, were better than me. Fortunately, uh, in my life, I had solid parents that affirmed me and you know, spoke into my identity and, and my worth and all that stuff. And so I was able to move on without hating the coach and hating the team and hating basketball and, and being damaged or anything like that. Uh, because probably left on my own, I, I probably would have hated all of it. But still, throughout that season, I would watch from the bleachers and... Secretly, I loved it because the team was terrible. 
and they would lose, and players weren't faithful and wouldn't show up and were leaving the team, and they barely had enough guys to play. And I'm just sitting on the bench, and I made sure I came to every single game and sat right next to the bench. And I would even, like, keep score, and just I would be all in. And, you know, I just was just hoping that that coach would just, you know, realize that I was there and just be like, man, I should have put him on the team. That guy is just so faithful. He's here every game. He would have made a great player. So there was a small evil part of me that liked seeing the team fail. But really, ultimately, I just kept wishing that I was taller and faster than some of those guys. But I've realized that this doesn't just apply to high school sports. It's like this in so many aspects of life that that we engage in every day. It's like this. We look around to see how we're doing. We look around to see if we measure up to others. In other words, we say it like this. We all live in the land of Ur. Not Ur from the Old Testament, you are, but E-R. We all live in the land of Ur because we want a bigger Ur added to, to the end of a lot of those attributes or those, those adjectives that describe us. We want to be richer and skinnier and stronger and prettier and happier and cooler and smarter and taller and talented Er, I guess. I want more or, more er than you. Because if I have more er than you, then I feel better about me. You know, they're good, but I'm, I'm er. I'm er. Where do we see this happening? Well, lots of areas. For example, this applies to dating. You want your boyfriend or your girlf- girlfriend to have some errs, right? You want him to be richer. You want her to be prettier. You want him to be cuter. You want her to be smarter. It applies to dating. It applies to marriage. We say things like, you know, I just want my spouse to reach their full potential. Or we tell them, you know, you, you need to get more er. You need to get more er. Maybe not in the beginning. We don't do that. But after a while. But, you know, it's really not even about them. It's about what people think of me. And it affects our marriages. It applies to parenting. Because, you know, you have kids and you think it's going to, everything's going to change. And then you realize that you have kids and you still want more er. It's still there. You keep pushing them and pushing them. And it's not even about them you're comparing, you're, you're comparing your parenting skills to other people's parenting skills. Isn't it sad when, when you love when your friend's kids mess up or when they lose or, or when the, the perfect image of the perfect family that maybe you see on social media or something, and when it gets tarnished or it gets broken, and then there's that little piece of you deep down that's like, hmm, yep. It's just a little bit of satisfaction, just a little, like, oh, that's good. I'm glad to see that. I knew it wasn't like that. I knew it wasn't as good as they portrayed. And you kind of find enjoyment in that. Then there's another side where, where we actually do have more er than somebody else. So we start feeling superior er to someone. I don't even have to tell you how bad of a, of a habit this is. And if you've ever doubted that there's sin in the world, just think about how gross this stuff is. That we're constantly comparing and competing. But then there's this other group who want more than er. They want est. These are the est people. They want to be the smartest and the fastest and the richest And they're super competitive about getting ahead or about uh, having the most or about working the hardest. These are the S people. Or maybe for you, you've not really had much of a problem with being jealous of others or, or not liking them because of what they seem to have going for them. Maybe that's not been the issue. Maybe you aren't trying to be the S at everything. Maybe you look in the mirror and you don't like you. 
And the reason is that you will never be as blank as them, whoever them is, whoever they are. Maybe that's what it is, that because of whatever's happened to you, you look in the mirror and you just think, man, never going to be good enough, never going to make it. Because you're looking around at what other people are portraying, what other people are doing, and you don't think you'll ever measure up. But you know what? That's a toxic way to live. So here's the bottom line for this series. It's very simple. There's no win in comparison. There's no win in comparison. Even if you really are better or you are, you're worse than someone else, there's really never any finish line or win or sense of satisfaction. It's just really dangerous, and it can be a huge distraction. Some of us may have debt right now in our lives, financial debt that we're drowning in simply because we're trying to keep up with everyone. We're trying to keep up, keep up with specific people, friends or family members or neighbors or whoever it is in our head that we feel like we have to be like by having a certain type of lifestyle, and so we're drowning in debt. Some, some of us might be driving our spouse crazy because we have unrealistic expectations and we keep pushing them and pushing them. Some of us might not get along with our relatives because, if we're honest, it's because we're jealous. Because we may not have their marriage or we may not have their looks or we may not have their kids and so we find ourselves rejoicing over their failures. And so, you know, we say things when things happen or when it's not as it seems. We say, see, I told you. They never really had it all together. See, I, I knew it the whole time. You know, now, now they're really going to know what it's like. It serves them right. You know, it serves them right. I knew they weren't all that great, that they didn't have it. They didn't have as much or they weren't as happy as it seemed. And now that they're going through something, see, I told you. And we see in the story of Jesus that one of the main reasons that the religious leaders handed Jesus over to Pilate was because they were jealous. That Jesus had the favor and he had the attention of the crowd and they wanted the attention of the crowd. They had that before. They were in charge. They were the spectacle. They were the moral authority. And now Jesus is coming on the scene and they all want to follow him and listen to him. And so this drove them to hand over this innocent man and to demand his death, crucify him. And so in, a, in an obviously less extreme way, we too can hurt people because we compare ourselves to others. So many times we end up punishing innocent people because we made our issue their issue. So what do we do? How do, you, how do you keep from doing this and yet still motivate your, your kids or motivate your spouse to, to change or to improve? Because we do need to help each other grow, right? We need to help each other change. How do you do it without slipping into the comparison trap and looking around to see, well, are we doing good? Well, they're, they're, not, they're doing a little bit better. You know, you could do a little bit better. I mean, so-and-so... They've got it together, but you really don't. Right? How, do we, how do we stop that? How do we keep from slipping into that? Is there anything in the Bible that can help me with my habit of comparing myself with others? Well, there's good news because there is. So let's get some insight from the book of Ecclesiastes. We don't often turn there, but we're going to do that today. We're going to look at Ecclesiastes 4. If you have a Bible, you're welcome to turn there. It'll be on the screen as well. So Ecclesiastes was written by King Solomon, who was King David's son. You may have heard King David. If, if you're not familiar with church lingo, he's the guy who killed the giant Goliath. Uh, he's the one who, who took over. for the. He was the second king of Israel. He's probably the most popular king and well-known king. Um, he's the one who killed the lion and the bear while he was shepherding his sheep. But his son, Solomon, is the one who wrote Ecclesiastes, and he was actually the wisest man who ever lived because he, God asked him, what, what do you want, and I'll give it to you. And Solomon said, 
very wisely. He said, give me wisdom. That's what I want. And so the Lord gave that to him. And so he became um, the wisest man ever. And so he had some things to say in Ecclesiastes 4 that can help us. And so by chapter 4, by the time we get there, Solomon has, has been kind of taking a step back and in sort of a melancholy way has been reflecting on how the whole of life is really just a collection of these seasons and how everything is so temporary and so many of life's pursuits are, are temporary and they're really meaningless when you consider the grand scheme of all things, especially in light of eternity. And then in, in Ecclesiastes 4 verse 4, where we'll pick up today, he says this, Then I observed that most people, most people are motivated to success because they envy their neighbors. But this too is meaningless, like chasing the wind. Like chasing the wind. See, King Solomon noticed that the thing that drives people, he said most people, is envy. Now, we probably wouldn't get much of a show of hands if we said, how many people are envious today? Probably wouldn't be a lot of people going, I am, I'm envious, I have envy. But when we really, when we really start looking at the deeper recesses of our hearts, what is envy? Because that sounds like a really bad word. Right? I don't, I'm not going to be that. No, that's not me. That's something from a fairy tale, or that's the bad guys. But look at, look at the definition of envy. It's simply a feeling of discontent or covetousness wanting what someone else has, okay, with regard to another's advantages, success, or possessions. It's a feeling of discontent or covetousness with regard to another's advantages, success, or possessions. You could also describe envy in a really practical sense just as being in competition with others. Comparing. Solomon saw people that they, they, they would look at where they were in life and they would, they would assess that based on where everyone else was. Am I doing good? Am I doing good? Am I doing okay? Well, let me, let me look over here. Okay, well, I guess, I guess with those people, they're like two steps behind me. All right, that's good. That's good. Well, what about these people over here? Oh, man, they're, they're kind of, I'm doing better than them, but wait a minute, what's that guy doing? Oh, no. That guy's ahead of me. He's way farther in life than I am. And wait, he's five years younger than me? Oh, no. Great. My whole life is passing me by. I'm failing. That guy's crushing it. And I'm... He, Solomon saw people doing this. See, it's not just a modern thing. This is an ancient thing. This is in the human heart to do. But then Solomon gives us a really good analogy of what comparing and comparison is like. He said, it's like chasing the wind. It's like chasing the wind. Now, it's pretty obvious, right, that you can never catch the wind. We feel the wind. We see the effects of the wind, but we can never catch the wind. Exactly. That's the point. There is no wind. There is no finish line. So it's like, okay, Solomon, so am I not supposed to be driven? Am I not supposed to work hard? Am I not supposed to do my best to accomplish things? I mean, you're just telling me it's all meaningless and I should just sit there and do nothing? Well, look at the next verse. Verse 5. He follows up about chasing the wind with verse 5. He says, fools fold their idle hands, leading them to ruin. So he's not, he's not saying do nothing because Solomon knew that eventually if you sit around for a long enough time, you are going to self-destruct. That's not how we're wired. We were not created to be idle and to be lazy. That's not how God made us. So he's not telling us in verse 4 to be less productive. Okay, Solomon was very productive. He's the king that oversaw the building of the temple. David didn't get to do that. Solomon got to do that. He was productive. Jesus was definitely productive. And he did all of his works and everything we read about in the Gospels. Pretty much he did that in three and a half years. And he died when he was 33. He was productive in his young life. 
Here's the key, though. It's in the next verse. Look at verse 6. He says, And yet, better to have one handful with quietness than two handfuls with hard work and chasing the wind. Now, th this is important. I want to read it again. He says, better to have one handful with quietness, with peace, with fulfillment, with contentment. Okay? Better to have that than two handfuls with hard work and chasing the wind. Basically, striving and stressing and driving to achieve and to gain so, in other words, Solomon's saying it's better to have one hand open and to only have what one hand can hold, where God can put things in the hand and remove them as he sees fit. It's better to have that than to have two clenched fists hanging on to everything you can possibly gain and get and own in this life. Because if you live with two clenched fists, I mean, not only will you not live a life that is God-honoring and, and Christ-centered and, and glorifying Him, not, not only that, but you will not ever have peace or fulfillment because after you grab everything you can, there's always something more. There's always something that you cannot get. Someone always has more err than you do. And your efforts end up being like chasing the wind. I forget who it was that was asked. It was a, a billionaire. And they said, you've gotten all this money. I mean, you basically have everything you could ever want. Billions of dollars. So what's the secret? How, how much money is enough money? Like at what point, you know, is it like I've, I've got enough? And you know what they said? Just a little bit more. This is a billionaire. Just a little bit more. There's always going to be more. There's always going to be someone that has more er. There's always going to be an est. And you might be the est for a season. If you watch sports, you know how it is. You got the champion. The confetti comes down. They win the Super Bowl. And then what happens? It starts all over again. I'm like, well, you did that, but you're not the est anymore. You're not the best anymore. You know, you've got that in sports where you got athletes getting older, right? Even Michael Jordan got older. LeBron's getting older now. You know, Tom Brady's getting older. And you, you just look and go, well, they, they were the best. They were on top. But now there's other people in the mix. It's always going to be that way. Better to have one handful with quietness, with peace. Just let that sink in for, for a moment. When the temptation is there to, to keep grabbing and striving for more err, let this verse and let this thought just rise to the surface. Because the hard question is, do we really believe this? Do we really? Because it's a, it's a game changer if we can get it. You know, with the, with the holiday season approaching, I love... I love Christmas and Thanksgiving and all, all the, the stuff that goes on. But there's one thing that just kind of nauseates me is just that feeling of consumerism. Does that bother anybody else? Like, oh, we got to go get our kids 45 presents and, you know, got to got to do that. You have to. Oh, you don't want anybody getting under the tree and there's not, you know, major life changing gifts under there. Right. I mean, you got to go into debt. Use your credit card. You've got to. And that's the season we're heading into. And every year I feel it coming. I'm like, oh boy, here we go. Lord, help us. Help us this year. It's tough. So do we really believe this? That better is one handful with quietness than two that are clenched fists. Two that are striving and striving and comparing and looking around and really chasing the wind. You know, when I start looking to the left. I can just catch myself and say, there's no point in looking to the left. And I'm tempted to look over here. There's no point in looking to the right. I'm just, I feel it. I'm just trying to get more. I'm just trying to be, get more err, and I'm trying to get two handfuls. And when I do, I'm going to want three handfuls, but then I'm going to panic because I only have two hands and I can't get that third one. And I'm going to start stressing 
And that's tough. It's what happens, though, when we live in the land of Ur. So let's finish the passage for today, verses 7 and 8. He says, I observed yet another example of something meaningless under the sun. This is the case of a man who is all alone without a child or a brother, basically without an heir, yet who works hard to gain as much wealth as he can. Okay, that's the scenario. We got a man who doesn't have a child or a brother. He has no heir, and yet he's driven and he's working and he's gaining all this wealth. And he's, he's in it. He's going full force, all in, 110%. And then Solomon says, but then he asks himself, who am I working for? Why am I giving up so much pleasure now? It is all so meaningless and depressing. See, some, some people work and work and work and work, and they're just never content. And they end up missing out on so much in life. And so one day, as the man in this story, he, he asks this important question. Who am I working for again? Why, why am I doing this? Why am I choosing to toil and stress myself to the max instead of being content, instead of having the one hand open? Why am I doing this? Why do I live like this? Why do I constantly look at the world around me and others around me to measure how I'm doing? Why can't I just stop for a minute and just enjoy what I have spent my entire life to get or to achieve? But you know how it is. Many times we, we work and work and work and we, we have these goals and we reach these goals or we get the stuff and then we don't even enjoy it. We don't. I've talked to people so many times. That, that, that want all the stuff that the world offers and we're going to get all the toys and we're going to get the extra house and we're going to get the four by four. You know, we're going to get everything that would make us happy and then don't even enjoy it. Well, we can't. We got to work. We got to work more and more and more and more. And it's just this cycle, this hamster race that's just chasing the wind. And in the end, I talked to somebody recently who said, I had all of that and then I was so empty that it was pointless, and then they lost everything. But it's human nature to be comparing, to be competing, especially when it comes to material things, where we end up buying stuff that we don't need with money that we don't have to impress people that we don't even like or that we don't even know. Buy things that we don't need with money that we don't have to impress people we don't like or know. That is the way of the world. That is the chasing of the wind that we naturally do, if not for the power of the Holy Spirit and his word sinking into our hearts. And then King Solomon ends verse 8 with this statement. It's all so meaningless and depressing. Well, thanks, Solomon. Not the most positive outlook, but that's what it looks like when you live in the land of Ur. It never is enough. As long as you're trying so hard to tightly hold on to two handfuls, it doesn't matter what's in your hands. It doesn't matter how smart your kids are or how good looking your spouse is or how nice your house is or how much money you have or how skilled you've become in your life or how independent you are. It doesn't matter. It's a miserable business. And you'll never be able to find that deeper level of fulfillment that the Lord offers. Why? Because remember, there is no win in comparison. There's no win. So what if we learned to catch ourselves when we started to live that way, when our open hand becomes starting to become two clenched fists? What if, what if we caught ourselves? Because really the issue is that all of us use something as a, as a guide or as a standard or really as a mirror. We all use something. The question is, what am I going to use as a reference point to assure me that I'm doing okay? Where do I look? 
to, to know. How do I know? What is the mirror that I can see who I truly am? Because see, it doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are or how great you've become or how not great and how much you've struggled. It really doesn't matter because all of us are looking to someone or something to tell us that we're okay. And working with people for a few decades now, I see this so much. And let me just tell you where one of the biggest problems that we see this happening is when there is an absent father in the picture. That, especially men, our dads, you as a dad, let me just talk to the dads. You as a dad, if you have a son or even a daughter, you need to understand your role of, you, your, of, of helping form your, the identity of your children. That they will look to you to know, are they okay? You and I did the same thing. If you have a son, if you're a man and you have a son, your son is looking to you to know, do I have what it takes to be a man? Am I okay? And when that father is not there or does, is not emotionally there or doesn't understand the role, there's a, there's a gap. There's a hole. And hard, sometimes it's hard for kids to assign that to a God when they didn't have an example as a father. Father God, mm, I don't know about that. My father didn't really do anything. He didn't put a covering over me. He didn't put a stamp on me saying, yes, you're approved. You have what it takes. And it's, it's very challenging. And some of us carry that all throughout our lives. And it, it comes out in weird ways where we overcompensate. Some of these guys that just are always real tough, you know, they got to be real tough and Got to act super macho, and anytime you mention anything about a feeling or any, oh, whoa, whoa, yeah, that girl stuff, you know, they got to have all the big toys and wear the right stuff, and you talk about football, and you know, it's we got to be real tough. Why? Because they don't know if if they're good enough to be a real man or not. I see it because I've been able to peel back the layers sometimes, and underneath is just a really scared, confused boy who no one ever told him that you have what it takes. To be a man, his dad never looked at him and says, you're, you're mine, you're good. So I didn't plan on sharing all that today, but I'm telling you that, that these issues are a big deal. They really matter. And our families, and uh, it's, you know, it applies to, to girls as well, because we're all looking to someone or something. How do I know? How do I know that I'm Okay. Our culture is one of the worst because we don't have a rite of passage for anything. How do you know when a boy becomes a man? Well, when he has his first beer? What is it? When he, when he drives, maybe? Or what? Is it some sort of romantic thing? Is that, how, how do we know that you have crossed over? You're no longer a boy. You're a man. We have nothing for that. Nothing of any substance. Think about it. That's why some cultures actually gather the men of, of the church or of the village and take the, the, the 13-year-olds out to a, an experience, and, and they look at them and they say, you have what it takes. God has called you. God has created you. You have a purpose. Everything you have or everything you need, you already have. Now, be a man. Have responsibility. And, and they give them this, this whole thing is passed down. But we don't have that in our culture. So we're just left to fend for ourselves. That's why so many guys won't gather with other guys because they're afraid that they're going to be found out because they don't know what they're doing. Sorry, guys, I didn't mean to expose us a little bit there, but it's true. We don't do it because we're afraid. I don't want to open up. I don't want to be vulnerable. I don't want anybody to see that there's, there's a lot of fear behind all of my outside stuff, all of my image that I'm portraying. We're all looking to something or someone to tell us that we're doing okay. So where are you looking for this assurance, for this validation? Is it, is it dad? Is it mom? Is it, is it your family? Family name? Or maybe an uncle or an aunt or a cousin or somebody like that? Or is it something else entirely like money? Are you looking at money saying, as long as I have this, then I'm okay? 
I'm okay. As long as I can feel the security of money, then I'm succeeding. Or is it a job? As long as I have this job, that this job will define me, that this is where I'm looking to know because I got a better job than they do. Is that where you're falling into the comparison trap? Is it your looks? Is it your kids? Is it your husband or your wife? Where are you looking? Solomon says that you'll never feel like you're okay no matter what you achieve if you keep comparing yourself to others and keep looking around. It's chasing after the wind. So next week, we're going to follow up with this and we're going to deal with the question that if there's no way to avoid looking somewhere for validation and for a sense of accomplishment, then where do I look? Like what and, and where should my mirror be? So I want to end our time together today with some questions, just some reflection questions for all of us to consider. Reflection questions based on what Solomon's saying and what we talked about today. The first one is, are you exhausted from trying to keep up with blank? You insert in the blank there. Are you exhausted just trying to keep up with keeping up with somebody? It's like, you know, I wish I didn't even know what they had or where they went on vacation or what they drive. I, I wish that I just lived on an island and I never saw anybody because then I could be content. Some of you want to say amen right there, right? You just want to live on an island and kick back, not see anybody. Well, there's some truth to that because it's awareness of others and awareness really that fuels our discontentment. It's true. The, the less we're aware the, that maybe the more content we could be. However, awareness is never going to go away. You can't just move to a little tiny island somewhere and live by yourself the rest of your life. There's people in the world, especially if you're going to follow Christ. We have a responsibility to engage others. So awareness is never going to go away. So we've got to figure out a way to deal with this. So are you exhausted from trying to keep up with someone the second question, are you allowing what others have to keep you from enjoying what you have? You know, you have eight-foot ceilings, and they're great, and you bought the house, and you loved it, and then you just saw that your friend bought a house, and they have ten-foot ceilings. And so now you can't even enjoy your house. Even though your house, it's the same as the day you bought it, and you loved it, right, and you took the pictures, and you moved in, and you loved it, and now can't even be there. I hate this house. It's so small. Or, you know, you have the iPhone 12, which is great, right? For those that have it, that's a new phone, iPhone 12, but now the iPhone 13 just came out. Yes, it did, and it has a cinema mode now. Great, so that ruins everything, right? So you're sick of your phone. Because, not just because you saw the commercial, it's never because of the commercial. It's because your coworker got the new 13. And you're going, why did they get that? They, they make less money than I do. They're younger than I. Like, this is ridiculous. They shouldn't be able to get that. I should have that. But remember, even if you got something better and newer than what they, they have, there will always be someone with better and the newer. It's going to happen. You're just chasing the wind. So are you allowing others, are you allowing what others have to keep you from enjoying what you have? Third question, and there's five. The third one, do your children feel compared to other children? And the follow-up to that is, does it stem from you comparing yourself with other parents? Your children feel compared. So do you enjoy your kids or do you just push and push and drive them to the point of meltdown or being overwhelmed because of what everyone else's kids are doing or what everyone else's kids are a part of or are accomplishing? Do you know that there are couples who would have loved, loved to have a child like yours, but they can't? The issue isn't what group your child is in or what grade they got or how much they're involved in. The issue is that they 
are your child. They're yours, given to you by God. Can you enjoy them? Or are you just going to keep pushing them and, and just raising the, the level of expectation for them because of what somebody might think about you as a parent? And some of you know this because this is the type of family that you grew up in. That now you're so disconnected from your family or your parents because it always seemed at the end of the day to be about performance. It was a performance-based that you, you came home with a 92 on your test, and the question was, why didn't, you get a, why didn't you get 100? That it's constantly just the bar keeps moving, keeps being raised. It's never good enough. How is it never good enough? How, how is it never good enough? Because you're constantly being compared to someone else. Why aren't you more like your brother? Why aren't you getting the best grade in the class? Why aren't you the star of the team? Why aren't you scoring more goals? You know, always comparing and pushing the line farther out. Fourth question. Does your spouse feel compared to other people's spouses? Is it possible that your husband or your wife, if you're married in here, that they feel like you're dissatisfied with them because of your tendency to compare them to other people's spouses, to other husbands or wives? Now, this doesn't always come out in the, in the most obvious ways. We, you know, a wife would never say, hopefully, to her husband, hey, babe, you know, that, that, that guy, he makes a lot more money than you do. You know, you should probably work on that. That probably wouldn't go over, right? The husband's not going to say, oh, wow, thank you so much for telling me that. I will now go and try to earn more money so that I will be on top and, and we will be happier because we're better than them. No, probably not. Or husbands, you know, we would never say, you know, honey, that lady over there, she's your age, right? But she looks a lot younger than you do. I mean, what's going on? Oof. Hopefully, there's not an idiot man in here who would say anything <laughs> like that. Because I promise you what you would not hear would be, oh, man, you're so right. She is my age and looks a lot younger than me. I am going to make some changes. I'm going to do some things. Thanks for pointing that out. Appreciate that. Nope, not going to hear it. Hopefully none of us would ever say things like this to our spouse. But if you're constantly comparing him or you're constantly comparing her in your mind, do you realize, do we all realize that we're undermining the very thing that we said is so important to us, that our marriage, when we made those vows for better or worse, that we're undermining that when we look around. We were happy until we started looking around. You were great until I started looking around and saying, wait, but those guys, I mean, did you see their Instagram post? That is so happy. They're just, they're out in the field with their kids and they all match, you know, and they... They have a color scheme that's wonderful. It's like from Better Homes and Gardens or something. It's just so nice. We don't, we don't do that. You know, our clothes have stains on them, and I can't get my kids to get dressed. And oh, It's your fault. It's your fault. It's funny, but it's funny, but it's true. See how dangerous this is? This is? Wouldn't it be just amazing to get to the place where we just say, one hand out. This is better. This is better. This is where I'm going to live. I'm not going to live in the land of Ur. I'm not going to do it. I will resist. Last question. This is a hard one. Who would you secretly enjoy seeing fail? Yeah, hurts a little, doesn't it? I almost called these questions, instead of reflection questions, I almost called them make you mad questions. <laughs> but I thought, no, let's just keep it simple. But yeah, it fits. Who would you secretly enjoy seeing fail? Isn't that one of the ugliest parts of the human soul? Sin in the world, I mean, imagine if we could do what Scripture talks about and, and actually rejoice with people when things are going well and mourn with people when they don't go so good. 
It, it seems so simple, doesn't it? And we think, yeah, I do that. But, but take a closer look. Sometimes there's things in our hearts that we would never come out and say it. I'm so glad they're failing. It's not, it's not a vocal thing. It's a heart thing and a mind thing. Jesus commands us to love people. But you can't love someone that you secretly hope will fail. Can't do it. It's in opposition to our faith. This way of being. True followers of Christ, we can't measure our worth or our accomplishments by the rise and the fall of other people around us. People will rise and they will fall. And I don't know how it plays out for you in your life where the comparison trap is laid. But for those of us that are in ministry, it's laid at the success and the failures of other pastors and leaders in churches. That's where the enemy tries to bait us in. And so you see things on social media about, you know, these, even some of my own friends. That, oh, they're just, man, they have changed the world and they're on the news and all these big time things happening. And the enemy comes in and sits at the table, as we've been talking about in our Bible study, and says, why should, why should they have that? What did they do that's so good? Why are they so special? And that's when the hands, no, one hand, one hand to the Lord of peace. Say, no, God, you have a plan. You have a way. You have a course charted out for me. And I am so happy for them. Praise the Lord that the kingdom is expanding. Right? Isn't that the attitude we want to have? So I don't know where it, how it translates into your world, into maybe your job or family life or whatever the sphere of, however the enemy. Where does he lay the trap for you? And one of your clues is who do you secretly hope will fail? When you're, if you're on social media, watch what happens as you scroll through. Watch Put a, put a meter on your heart, and when you see something that is beautiful or wonderful about someone, do you get a little bit upset? That's your cue. Oh, this is where the enemy has laid the trap. So, you can't really be a sincere follower of Christ and chase the wind at the same time. This isn't just a social issue or a psychological issue, I'm telling you, this is a spiritual issue. It's a spiritual issue. So let's go from two clenched fists to one open hand, and let's stop chasing the wind. Let's stop living in the land of Ur, because there's no wind in comparison. And that's where we'll pick it up next week. As we look at where do we look, how do we know that we're okay, without looking to others. Can we stand together? I'm just going to give you a brief moment to go to the Lord, to talk to him. If you know the Lord, you can go to him right now and say, Lord, I, I think I've been living in the land of Ur a little bit, and I want to get out. I want to walk the path you have for me, not someone else's road, not someone else's life, but my life, my journey. I want to walk that. And help me to be okay because of who you say I am. If you don't know the Lord, you've probably been living in the land of Ur for a long, long time. You've probably been looking around at other people to know if you're okay for a long time. But you don't have to live that way. That when you become a child of God and you surrender your life to him and you open everything up and say, hey, everything is here, Lord, for you. It's subject to change. When you do that and you turn away from your sin and your way of life, doing it your own way, when you do it his way, you can experience some of this that Solomon's talking about. You can stop chasing the wind. You can have that moment and series of moments and months and years. You can have a life that's free from that. We sang about the chain breaker earlier. He needs to cut some of those chains today, maybe. Allow the Lord to do that. You can turn to him right now.
So let's go to him and let's pray. Lord, we lay our lives before you, thanking you that you care enough to speak to us and to intervene in our lives and to set us free and to reset our hearts so that we don't get caught up in chasing the wind and in pursuing things that really don't matter when in light of eternity. Help us, Lord, for those among us that follow you and are devoted to you, I pray for just an incredible wisdom and discipline and discernment as we go into this season that the comparison would drift to the background and that there would be an open hand to receive your peace during this chaotic, sometimes chaotic season, Lord. I pray for those who who are far from you, whether they've never known you or have just kind of walked away and they never stopped believing in you, but they're not really following you and serving you. I pray that you would you would come into their lives and you would break the chains that bind, chains of comparison and always wanting that er, that big er or richer or whatever it might be. Set us free, Lord, so that we might shine a light to those around us in our families, at work, in our communities that, that just show a different way to be. Help us to trust you more, Lord. I want to ask you today by just the raising of hand that you maybe you've been living a little bit in the land of Ur and you want to move on. You want to move out of that and you want to live in a place of freedom with the Lord. Would you acknowledge that by just raising your hand and saying, I'm ready. I want to go. I want to move. Yeah, all over. Just raise it up high to the Lord. Say, Lord, here I am. I'm ready to move out. I'm tired of living here. I pray over each one that's raising their hand, Lord, that specifically see what they need to do, that your Holy Spirit is moving in their hearts. I pray for a new season and a a new way of thinking, that you would renew our minds, that they would experience you in a fresh way like never before. They would walk in the freedom that you have given to us through the cross and through the tomb that is now empty and through the eternal promise that you are coming back again, Lord. This is just the in-between, the freedom that we can walk in. Ultimately, one day we will walk in total freedom with you in eternity. Praise you, Lord Jesus. You are worthy of all thanks and all glory and honor. We give you thanks for your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your attention and for being a part. Uh, If you're getting baptized, remember to stick around and head down to the chapel. for. It's just going to be probably 10 minutes. We're going to give you a little bit of info. And next Sunday, make plans to stick around, okay? We want to celebrate with all those getting baptized, and we want to cheer them on and give big, you know, claps and yells and all that stuff. It'll be a big time next Sunday right after church. But until then, hopefully we'll see you Wednesday. Ladies, you've got your meeting tonight, so we've got a lot going on today and this week. Uh, But we love you. Let me pray the blessing, and then we will be dismissed. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine on you and be gracious to you and give you peace. And may you be a light in the darkness. Amen. Amen. We love you. Have a great week.